And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple. He is the head of Rookie Jet Studio, cre creator of the upcoming RPG Overarms, and yes, this is a motherfucking JoJo reference. The one and only Corey Burns. How are you doing today, man? Doing good. Could be better. <laughs> Feeling kind of sweaty. Been busy. <laughs> yeah, I think I think we I think we all I think we all could feel could be doing a bit better, but um. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. The current climate is not ideal. Look, everybody looks at me like I'm crazy whenever I say I can't wait for the winter to come so I don't so I so I can walk so I can walk outside without feeling like death. Um <laughs> at least at least you can put on more clothes and you can take off. You still with me? Um And you hear me? And hang hang on one sec, my Hello. Hang on, folks. There's a bit of there's a bit of a issue. Ah, there we go. Sorry, my my ping decided to act to decide to act up for a second. So let's see if we can. Hey there. Okay, that, now we got it. Fi now we got it fixed. Sorry about that. Either my either something happened with my ping, or Discord decided to act a fool for a moment. Yeah, Discord isn't the greatest. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we can just pick up. You can just yeah. edit the video or whatever or the audio. Yeah. <clears throat> um. Now with that with that said, I it's a bit of a tradition to open with the humble beginnings. So with that in mind, walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games, and what was it that made it stick for you? Oh, man. Um, I've always wanted to play, well, before I knew there were others, you know, it was Dungeons & Dragons for me, mm -hmm. because that's all I had known. You know, thank God the Wizards of the Coast for their enormous marketing budget. Um, but, essentially, when I was a kid, I had found a box full of old D&D &D books, um, None of them were like a core book or anything, but I, I, I could read through and like, get enough information from that where I, I immediately understood that I wanted to play D&D. &D. Um, but, you know, we didn't have access to the books. I didn't know where to even get the books. Um, and that would also be a fight between me and my mom to see if she would let me own the books. She uh, probably, I, I couldn't say for sure, but she would probably be one of those people who bought into the satanic panic um, trend mm. from the 80s of, about Dungeons and Dragons. But regardless, um, I had taken what I had found in that box and hid it in my room, and then I created a super simple version of D&D &D to play with my friends. Um, we never ended up playing, maybe more than twice or so, but... Um, and, you know, fast forward, good Lord, probably like 18 years later or so, um, I ended up reconnecting with some of my friends from my childhood, and they introduced me into D&D, &D, and that's kind of where I got my start playing with them. Mm -hmm. um, so 
all in all, I mean, it's always clicked with me. It's just a matter of getting into it and finding people to play with. Yeah. Now, obviously, over, obviously, Overarms is taking a lot of influence from jo from uh, stuff like JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, but you also mentioned yeah. um, uh, Sh Shaman King and po and mm -hmm. possibly uh, Persona. Although the line between all three of them can be thin at t can be thin at times but um it, yeah as long as they have a punchy ghost uh yeah. it can work at over arms mm -hmm. <laughs> um but ob obvious obviously the uh, main one that's going to come to mind for people is jo is jojo um absolutely so my first th my first thought on this is um given how long running that's that series has been um first off what how did you first get exposed to that to that particular series? So I actually first started off playing Persona 3. Um, I had emulated that through a PSP emulator and was playing playing a little bit of that. And I ended up getting one of my friends into it. And they started watching JoJo since they are kind of similar with the idea with the concept of stands and personas. Mm -hmm. And at first, I wanted nothing to do with JoJo's Bizarre Adventure um, because we started off with Part One. And if you know anything about JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, Part One doesn't have anything to do with stands. Um, it's essentially just a man uh, dealing with his two <laughs> his two kids. And one of them becomes a vampire. Spoiler alert. Um, <laughs> hey, the, so uh, I, I wasn't the statue, interested in JoJo's Bizarre Adventure at first. Spoilers. And I think, I think my, my friend actually dropped it after the first season. And it took me a couple more years. But I, as I started looking into JoJo's, I was just like, man, this just seems like something that I should, I should be into. Something that I should want to watch. So I sat down and forced myself through, you know, part one. And then... Part two was actually really great. And then part three is when things got super spicy, um, at least for me. So that that's kind of how I got exposed to JoJo's. Um, there, there was also just a bunch of different factors. I think the thing that really just pushed me over the, the edge to dive into that JoJo hole uh, was um, all the memes I had seen about it. I'm just like, man, I really want to understand these. It's right up my alley. I, I just need to dedicate the time to it. So I did. Yeah. Um, for, for me, I, um, I will freely admit that I, that I was exposed to Jojo before I'd even seen the anime because I, I had the, I had the uh, fighting game on the dreamcast. Oh, nice. Yeah. Um, which, while while it was certainly a good fighting game, and this was during this was during that point in time when Capcom was really on their shit when it came to mm -hmm. when it came to fighting games. Oh yeah. Um, the I'd have a hard time recommending it now because that one only deals with Stardust Crusaders. Um, and then of course shortly after that, I found out about the original attempt at an at an anime, which again only dealt with part three, which. Well, part three is the most popular. It's one of those things where I hesitate to have people jump straight into that. Yeah, I mean, just just touching real quick on that game. That game is phenomenal, and there has not been any other JoJo's game that has touched it since, other than maybe the PS3 version. Um, uh, or the PS3 uh, JoJo's fighting game, which included all -Star a, a Battle. robust amount of people. Yes, All-Star Battle. That, that game was amazing. Um, um, that's the that's the one I'm a little bit more willing to recommend simply because that has the most complete roster of any. And no matter what, oh, you're dealing sure. with a party fighter anyway, so you're not playing it for the balance or anything like that. For sure, yeah. Um, yeah, I recommend the latest one for the PS4 that's more of an arena fighter. Um, that, that I'm not too big of a fan of. It's cool, but I'm just not a big fan of it. Mm. But yeah totally agree with you uh not recommending part three to people um immediately i mean jojo has great things in every part um so if somebody's truly dedicated to getting into jojo's always start with part one just so you get the full story as it comes but if you know i mean i'm gonna get so much flack for this but if you know you're really just interested in the stands, there's nothing wrong with starting at part three and working your way backwards to figure yeah. out what actually happened. Um, that's that said, is 
I will I will admit that something that always stuck with me, especially since um it was especially since it was something that stuck with me in a um sim in a similar in a franchise not too far off in its craziness known as Guilty Gear, is oh, yeah. the amount oh, of Guilty musical Gear. references. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like uh, for whatever reason, a lot of people <laughs> think the musical references started with um part three. No, <laughs> not not no, the no, case. No. No, 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 no. They don't know about Speedwagon. Yeah, Robert E. O. Speedwagon. Right. <laughs> That's as obvious as it gets. Yeah. Um. And of course, it's not it's not the only case where so, where somebody where somebody has done that kind of thing. I remember a um I remember a manga called Bastard that was basically heavy metal meets D and D. To the, to the oh. point that <laughs> that that Actually, um that its main character was a reference to um. Except. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I remember seeing that. I think in like, I was when I was a kid, maybe at like Borders Books, that that kind of relic. So yeah, yeah. Not why do you got to remind? Didn't me know what it was about. Miss, That's neat. Why do you got to remind me about Borders, man? I miss Borders. <laughs> <clears throat> Did I lose you again? Um. Hang on. Hello. Okay, there there we go. Um uh, 1009, I think. Uh what is that? It's no, it's 10 like 12 and that cut out if you want to note that. Um when it come but with that, with that in mind, when when did the idea really start kicking into to take to take what you had your experiences when it came to Persona, right? When it came to JoJo or Aura, Shaman King, and turn that into an RPG experience. So mostly, um, this is this might be a little bit of a long explanation, um, but I I was traveling with my girlfriend back to her uh, hometown in Virginia and we had stopped in a little store there that sold like cards and tabletop RPGs and things like that. And this is really when I started to branch out from D&D because D&D didn't have everything I, I wanted out of tabletop role playing. Um, as you sort of get more and more into D&D, you start to realize that it's a little bit of a combat simulator and it has few more things, but it's primarily a combat simulator. So I ended up picking up this book at the, at the store called Ryutama, and I was really, really surprised to find out that, uh, you know, there, there was hardly any combat in it at all. I mean, there, there is some, but it's mostly focused on role-playing and travel, and it kind of has the name uh, Ghibli's Harvest Moon, I think. Um, something, something along those lines. It's been a while since I've read the back of the book. Um, but Ritama is definitely like the first game that I had picked up that really, like in tabletop, uh, in the tabletop gaming world, that really just resonated with me. So just, I mean, that opened the floodgates for me. I was like, I want to design something like this. So as soon as I, you know, started kind of creating games built off of Ritama, um, that's when the gears initially began turning for creating a JoJo's is our adventure slash persona RPG. Because when you look in the uh, market, there's, you know, there's a few fan made systems and things like that. But a lot of them just seem bogged down or specifically created to run either JoJo's or persona or Shaman King, etc. So I wanted to create a system that could be used more or less like a toolkit for each of these that allow people the utmost freedom to create whatever they wanted to create while still maintaining a balance with the game. Mm -hmm. um, now, something something I was something I was curious about when I did when I um when I did my own digging is right. you're using a you're you're using a system where die codes are the most par are uh, paramount, mm -hmm. and what I'm curious what I'm curious about with that is 
What would you what would you say the big a lot of times when pe when people see some sort of die code based setup, um, their mind always and inevitably ends up going towards Savage Worlds. Um, would you say that was would you say that was an influence at at some point, or would you say um, Ryutama was the biggest influences to how you approach design? Yeah, I've actually never played anything with Savage Worlds. I've never even opened a book or even looked into it. Um, I've heard a lot about it. Uh, but I, I I like to I like to really brew using those indie RPGs um, and Savage Worlds may be one and I'm just ignorant of it. But um, Ryutama was definitely the the catalyst for Overarms because of the way stats are generated in that game. Um, and in Ryutama, you have um, a few different spreads that you can choose and you can place those into any stat that you want. And I thought the freedom of being able to do that was amazing. Mm -hmm. um, and so I wanted to replicate something like that, but also something that allowed you to kind of control two characters at the same time. So Ryutama was definitely the catalyst, but Overarms took its own life after a certain period of time. I had actually uh, created a system for Overarms that I was running for about six months. Um, and play testing and then there was one night i was play testing with my group and i realized that the game that that system was just fundamentally broken and so i had to completely start from scratch with my system and i pushed forward with uh the current system we see now in over mm -hmm. um now when it comes now um when it comes to the when it comes when it comes to the the setup for um for dice for dice systems um, obviously this, I do, I do know the, that you did a, um, very interesting thing with how, um, you've, you've got a set of, you've got a set of stats for the, for the, um, user and a set of stats for the anima, which is your version of a, st of a stand or a, go or a ghost or what have you. Um, right. and now for... The first thing I the first thing I wanted to ask was was that was that particular um, junction set junction um, setup a um, core thing that you wanted to go th through from the get go or did or did it get iterated a bit and the other thing I was curious about is how um, is how criticals worked in this because I could see this kind of th I could see the case here where where it'd be it'd be a curiosity if criticals um, and fumbles were something that was less frequent in your game than they may be in, say, D and D. Right. So to answer the first question, um, <clears throat> that was always planned from the start, um, and primarily JoJo's Bizarre Adventure and a little bit in Shaman King. You you see the um, stands kind of acting as like an extension of the person. Mm -hmm. And they can do things that the person cannot do. So by that logic, to me, they needed to have separate stats because you see um, in, in certain scenarios where, you know, Jotaro, for instance, from part three is, uh, you know, punching somebody, but then his stand is also punching them as well. And you see different, different ways that they work in tandem. And so the way that a character has stats and the way that an anima has their own stats just felt to me like it makes too much sense to not include as the primary um, you know, foundation for how stats and how checks work. Um, the second question, yes, criticals and fumbles are much, much rarer in overarms than probably any other tabletop RPG. In a lot of my playtesting, I think I've only seen one critical ever. Which makes sense because you've either got to have them all as all as sixes or all at, or all tops. Right, and that also introduces something really neat. Where um, you know, if you're if you're rolling um, two of your lowest stats and they happen to be D4s, you actually have a higher chance of you know having a critical or a fumble. And that's kind of attributed to the or attributed to how um, you know if you're inexperienced at something, you may end up being really good at it, or you may end up failing horribly. So, with that low of dice, 
um, that's, that's kind of the result that we would expect. Yeah. Now, when it, um, when it comes to, when I came, the one thing that I could, that I could pretend from my perspective, that I could potentially see it, ha it having some difficulty balancing was anima points. Um, were there any instances early on in playtesting where people were just burning through anima points too quickly or too slowly? Um, no, actually. Um, since with HP and AP, those stats uh, represent a resource rather than something that you would use. I mean, you're not going to make an HP check or an AP check. Mm -hmm. um, those, whatever value you put in there, like let's say, for instance, I put a 6 into my AP. That would immediately become double. So that would be 12 AP. Um, I haven't had any issues with people running out of AP or running out of HP. And I think people really overestimate how much they actually need. Um, because a lot I've had so many players pump, you know, a 8, 10, or 12 into their AP just to ensure that they have enough go around or their HP. They're worried about being too brittle or not being able to make too many moves. Um, and after playing once or twice, they get the idea that, hey, I don't need that many points. Um, and then I do have some players who absolutely just abuse their anima any chance they get. Would you suppose... Now, I might be... this. I will admit this is a bit of theory crafting on my end, but would sure. you suppose that uh, that particular approach of i need as much ap as possible is from an assumption that any time you that some people have that any time you use your anima you spend ap period even if it's just well, a junction roll if, if you they're correct in that instance anytime you use your anima you are using one ap so if you're trying to jump over a fence using your anima you are summoning it you are using it you're using ap mm -hmm. but you would only use one ap uh, versus like your abilities, where your first level ability uses 1 AP, the second ability uses 2 AP, and the third ability uses 3 AP. So um, it is a concern when it comes into later game, um, or sessions, I mean. And I don't think people are wrong for overestimating how much they would need. Um, but I don't think that people take into consideration that, um, you know, um, and they have the right reason not to, because uh, in the quick start rules, advancement is not covered, but in the full book, advancement is covered. And with the leveling table and the advancement section, you're able to increase some of your die values as time goes on. So if you had a 8 in HP, or AP, I should say, um, and you have 16 AP that you're burning through constantly, um, you can level that up to be the maximum value of 12 eventually. So you won't have to worry about being stuck that way forever. All right. Um, well, since, since you touched upon it, let's, di let's dive in, let's dive into that as, be as best as we're able to, to relatively, because sure. obviously I don't want, I don't want to give away too many spoilers. Um, right, right. When it comes to the advancement system, sure. is, Overarms is advancement system a case of a currency based advancement or is it doing something different than that? Um, so advancement is all done by milestone in this game. So you know if you had a successful session, you beat the main antagonist of the session, um, your GM can say you guys level up. Um, so leveling up is very, very simple in this game. Um, all you're really doing is changing the values of your animal or character. Mm -hmm. and adding new abilities. So, I mean, I, I wanted to ideally keep the game in that regard as simple as possible because I remember, you know, leveling up my characters in D&D &D and it would take forever because we, we have to, you know, go through so many things and change so many values that I wanted it to be very straightforward. Yeah. Um, so Over Arms is definitely a game that's, you know, in all aspects meant to be as simple as possible and meant to be fluid enough to where if you make a mistake, it's fine. Just move on. Yeah. Now, when it comes... Now, um... I know... Now, when it comes to the quick start, which, of course, I did go through back and forth a, f a few times, um, 
when it comes... One thing that I was curious about when I was looking through the example anima was <laughs> the was the idea of of multiple sta- of multiple stage ones. I th- and um obviously the bi- the big one that's ga- that's going to come to mind when I mention uh, multiple stage or ones w- that are a bit more complex is um echoes or in the dub reverb in uh, yeah, absolutely. part 4 simply mm-hmm. because that one in its three forms has three um, completely different abilities. Would in a situation like that, where what where what a given stand can do ch- changes with with its um different forms, would that be reflected through leveling up and learning new abilities, or would or would there or would there need to be a bit more legwork involved in a stand like um, Echoes? I think I think it works pretty fluidly, um, especially with some with something like Echoes or Koichi Stand, because it's been a minute since I've watched Part Four. I'll, I'll admit that, but um, I believe that as Echoes actually evolves from his egg form, he only uses that singular ability that he has. Yeah. So he never uses the older abilities. He only uses the newer ones that he has. So if you wanted to run something like that, that's totally fine. Um, and you could change their appearance and how they act, even if you wanted to have them a personality. And um, you could do that as as you go through the three abilities. That that would be super super simple flavor text that you could essentially throw into the game. Um, and if you wanted to mimic something in the idea that you know um, Echoes doesn't use any of their past abilities, you could technically make each ability stronger since you only have access to that one ability versus other people having access to three. So that's something to think about. Um, that's, that's a really neat suggestion, actually. I suppose a, um, I suppose another, ex- a, I suppose a better example of what, of what I was, of what I was kind of shooting for with this. And, um, I will admit this example might be a bit left field. So I'm not, so if you need me to give the skinny on this one, I, I will do that. And that is, um, Zetsway from Scryd. I've definitely heard of it, um, but I have no idea. Um, well, the thing, the the thing, the thing with Zetsway is that that that's a case of it does shift between between uh, two between two major forms. One of them, mm-hmm. one of them is the one that looks like a humanoid wearing wearing a, a straight jacket with these antennae that can that can that can um, cut at range. And the and the other is is almost this Naga like form that is a lot more of a close range fighter and a lot faster. Mm. Um, so when so um how would how would overarms handle something like that where you do have a case of a um a in this case an anima that sw- that switches between two different fighting styles depending on how the user wants to use it. Well, first, let me go into an explanation real quick. Um, Overarms is definitely, you know, compatible with a lot of different things, and I don't think that Scryde is exempted from that. But you would have to have everybody at the table playing kind of in that same universe, I think, in order for things to have true balance. Mm -hmm. Uh, So, for example, if you're running a JoJo's Bizarre Adventure-themed campaign, you probably wouldn't want to use a Persona um kind of character in that kind of campaign because versus you know the bevy of options you have when using a jojo's s character persona characters are also and their uh personas are limited to specific skills as seen and used in the video games um or even in the anime uh but with what you're talking about, as long as everybody is on board with what they're doing at the table, I don't think there's any issue with anything that you've said. Um, I think that you would have to maybe flesh out a little bit more of what the ability does and what triggers um, that kind of a change. Um, but I, I totally think that you could you could absolutely you know list that as ability one and two, and then if if in scribe that has a third ability, by all means, put it down there. It pro. Well, later in the series, there it later in the series there um there is one, but um. Spoiler warning. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. I said earlier that the, that there's a statute of limitations for spoilers, but um, I'm making an exception. Oh, that, for that's this. that's 
that's that's far past for scribe that thing's old isn't it yeah um but i i will admit i have a i have a soft spot for it the um that's fine <laughs> i th- i think it's i think it's one i think it's one of those things where um would it be fair to say that the that um that when deciding whether or not it's going more it's le- that a campaign is leaning more jojo or more persona that's something that the gm will have to um make clear at the start at like a session zero or something like that yeah absolutely because i mean it, you'd be i think you'd be very hard pressed to get a group of people together who know about you know who know everything there is to know about jojo's persona shaman king fate uh noragami even um scribe etc so if you know there's somebody in the group and i've had this happen quite a few times who isn't aware of what jojo's bizarre adventure is um the best thing that i do is i i essentially just show them a clip of you know an episode and explain to them a little bit about what jojo's is and if we have time um i will you know send them material for them to read or send them you know episodes to watch so they can become accustomed to it like just recently this past saturday we recorded a let's play of over arms um from a scenario called blood Inc. And um, in that scenario, um, if you haven't watched that episode and want to uh, <laughs> want to have no spoilers, skip past this part. But essentially, the uh, jellyfish um, that is being held aboard this boat is the anima user, and it produces a anima that looks like a human girl. Um, that that is like kind of created from the moisture in the air. And she doesn't exactly look like a human. She kind of has that uncanny valley vibe about her. Um, so, I mean, we had we had two players in that group who had no idea what JoJo's Bizarre Adventure was. They'd heard of it, they've heard of Persona, but they didn't have anything else to go off of. So it was really unique running that uh, that game because you know two people don't even understand. How to use their powers, but they caught on very quick. And if you listen to that episode, mm-hmm. um, you can kind of hear them understanding how to play and how to run their character and how to do the things they want to do. Yeah. It's, it's it's very neat. That's that said, I th- the way the way you describe the way you described it earlier, it, se- it seemed that the uh, vibe that you're going for that this is more of a uh, sandbox rather than trying to emulate a specific approach, which. For somebody like me, who's been an early adopter of mixing um, tabletop RPGs with anime, it presents a um, it presents another part in an interesting trend that I that I see, and maybe you've maybe you've seen this as well. Mm-hmm. For the longest time, if you wanted to do an anime RPG, you had to go with the universal ones. But I don't know when this I don't know when that shifted, but eventually you started seeing games that were more about emulating a specific genre or specific style within anime or within animation right. than tr- than trying to be all encompassing and I think it comes down to the fact that well despite what despite what some people want to want to try and claim anime and animation are not genres. Right. Right. Yeah, I, I've noticed that trend, um, uh, and I, I'm not a huge fan whatsoever of generic anime systems. Um, I feel that you know they need to be geared towards something. Um, you know, uh, let's say that it's an anime where people have legendary weapons or something like that. And sure, you would need to gear it towards these kinds of weapons and the mechanics that work with it. And there's a million different anime that have legendary weapons that people use that determine, you know, the capabilities of the people using the weapons. And so you could make an entire game out of that, or, you know, you could, you could absolutely take, um, oh goodness, what's what's another good example? Like, um, some of the, like the mech anime and things like that, like you've seen, uh, Lancer and Beam Saber, I'm sure. Uh, I, uh, I covered Lancer a few months back. Right on. So, um, you know, with Lancer and Beam Saber, those fall into that one genre that really work. Or even with Golden Sky Stories and Ryutama, those kind of follow the more wholesome uh, slice of life kind mm-hmm. of 
uh, genres. So, I mean, a generic anime system to me says, we didn't do a lot of work, we just want to play generic anime. And that tells me nothing because there's so many different, um, you know, corners of anime that there isn't really just one system that you can use that's going to cover everything. Um, I, so I, see a, I see a lot of... The the whole generic anime thing is more of a product of the 90s, and I consider it a product of its time. Because when you're dealing with anime in the 90s, or even in the early 2000s, the mm -hmm. amount of info that we could actually get was slimmer pickings than it is now. Right, right. Um, especially in the 90s when people didn't know how the hell, how the hell to dub things, right? Like, anytime somebody complains about an um, a anime dub in the last few years... I will always make make them watch those old anime ego dubs and and have them beg for and have them beg for mercy. Right. <laughs> yeah. It, there's. I mean, it's it's all come a long way. Mm -hmm. Um. I feel like I feel like anime to tabletop RPGs is becoming more and more popular in recent years. Yeah. Um. I mean, it, it's 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 evident. There's there's a lot. I mean, I I I like to speak with the uh, Katoki guys. Um, or Kodadama Heavy Industries people, the guys who translated Tenra Bancho Zero, mm -hmm. Ryutama, and uh, Shinobi Gami. And, I mean, th those guys really know their stuff. They're, they're great people, and um, they, they introduced me really into all of this. Um, and so I, I wrote a expansion for Ryutama last year. I think it came out last year. Remember, all, all of the time is sliding together at this point. Space but, is warped uh, and time is bendable. Right. And so, um, but they, they, they have curated the games they want to translate, and they've done such a good job of bringing these anime inspired games over to the West that, I mean, you, you, can't, you can't look at them and not at least want to turn a few pages. Especially if you're a fan of anime or not, I mean, they, the the art style is just brilliant. You know, you don't know if you're opening a comic, a manga, or a tabletop RPG. You look at the cover for some of these. So, um, um, another another one that com another one that comes to mind when you bring that kind of thing up is Bounty Head Bebop, which I will give you two guesses as to what that was taken inspiration from. <laughs> huh? Could it be Outlaw Star? <laughs> <laughs> well. That, well, that was one of them, <laughs> they, and there are and there are rules for feng shui magic in that book, so you're not too far off in that front. <laughs> right on. Yeah, I'm actually I've actually been working um, after Overarms was essentially completed, um, and in my spare time, I've been working on a sort of retama in space. Add quotations above that. Um, that is kind of inspired by. Uh, um, you know, Outlaw Star, uh, Cowboy Bebop, Star Trek, Macross, Space Battleship Yamato, Captain Harlock, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But we'll save that for another day. I don't have enough to touch on that. <laughs> yeah, that that'll be that'll be the. Um, uh, I would I would call it a I would call it a backdoor pilot called it a backdoor pilot, but that doesn't really qualify. <laughs> right. But I've actually yeah. never heard of that tabletop game you just spoke of. Yeah, um, I ended up finding that out by accident when when um so, when somebody when somebody brought it up. They all they did was was just put up the um put them an image of the cover and say, "Hmm, I wonder what this was taking inspiration from." And then, yeah. and then I did some digging. and I was like, "Oh, this is oh this is a thing." Um, of course, there's of course there's been a healthy amount of um of mech RPGs going all the way back to Mechton, which is still one of my um. Yeah. One of well, my definitive ones, even if the Gundam Senki book never got fully translated, and incidentally, I'm still holding out hope that one of these days somebody will translate Sword World. I know some people don't like Sword World's Sword World's mechanics, but um, I'd but I feel I I feel like I'd like to d deep dive into that for um historical purposes. Yeah, I I've, I've heard of that. I think through the Kodama people. Um, or at least people in their Discord channel. Um, yeah, it sounded interesting, but I, I don't know enough to comment on it further. <laughs> um, 
the sis- the system that's used in the fi- in the um finally released Kamigakari isn't too far from it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um as well as well as uh, double cross. They Yeah. They they're not it's not an exa- it's not an exact comparison but there's some sim- but there's some sim- there's some sim- there's some similar elements in in Kamigakari to the system that um Sword World 2.0 uses. Um <clears throat> The other reason I say historical purposes is you're probably familiar with um, Lodos, right? Record of Lodos? Yeah. Or... Yeah, yeah. Um, that got integrated into Sword World. It started out as a D&D replay um, huh. and eventually got integrated into that. And Louis the Rune Soldier also takes place in that setting. Even though the two of them are um, very tonally different because Louis the Rune Soldier is a comedy. Hmm. Um, but it's it's one of those things that I find interesting, and that's that's not to say that there aren't universal um, anime RPGs being developed now. It's just that they're a lot less frequent. Well, I would say that Kami Kikari is almost a universal system in its own. If you, I don't know if you flipped through that book or not. I have. I was I was one of, I, I was one of the people who was wa- who was waiting and waiting and and. After after the amount of time I was waiting, you're damn right. I'm gonna flip through that thing. <laughs> yeah, 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 um, yeah. It, um, I was looking through it, and I, I, it honestly discouraged me from the game. I mean, I'm just gonna throw that out there because I like, I like, um, if I'm playing something anime inspired, I want it to be focused on something. But as I was looking at the classes, and this is no no jab at Serpent Sea Games by any means, because I know they just translated it and they did their best job. Mm-hmm. Um, but for me, it's a turnoff because you have like a stand user, you have somebody who uses legendary weapons, you've got like a ninja, and it's very obviously taken from like, okay, here's our JoJo's Bizarre Adventure guy, here's our um, you know Tower of Druaga man, and here is our ninja lady from Naruto. And to me, it's just, it loses me immediately right there because I don't want to mix those worlds. Um, and for some people, they, they might want to mix those worlds and they'll have a blast doing it. But for me, I want things that are focused. Like, Shinobi Gami doesn't have knights in it, you know? Have you ever read Double Cross? I, I, I don't think that's translated into English, is it? Yeah, it's been translated. There? There's, been three, there's been three expansion books that have been translated. Maybe it's just really hard to get a hold of then, because I don't like owning PDFs. If anything, um, I have to own. I I I I have I have the the whole translated set in, set in um print. I've had that I've had that for a while. Really, they, you'll they, have they to send me a link. <laughs> there there was a corp double cross. The best way for me to describe it is a kind of Japanese X Men. Um, which is tight. <laughs> Um, there, there. It's very clear that there that there was some that there was some X Men analogs, even though the um thing that is that allows for their powers is not exact is a little less stable. But there were th- the only thing that's odd about it is the pr- the um is the page size for the core book compared to the expansions, because the the expansion the expansion books page size is the standard A four. Um, mm-hmm. but the, co- but the, um, the core book for whatever reason, I, th- I think it's page size is B5. It's basically the page mm-hmm. size you would see for a lot, for a large, for a volume of a large manga. Right. Um, I think the, I think the Japanese version of the D&D rules cyclopedia was about that same size. But again, this is one of those things that's interesting. And the, of course the other, um, one that I'm, Holding out hope that it gets translated is um, Tokyo Nova. There's been some fan translations, but I'd like to hopefully see an official one one of these days. Yeah, um, I'm trying to think of a couple, but my mind is drawing a blank. Um, I'm not. I, I I trust everybody in the the Kodama heavy industries or the Tohi um, Discord to tell me what what's on the up and up as far as coming from Japan. Um, I know right now, I think there's a group there that's kind of working on translating a game called Marginal Heroes. Um, I don't know too much about personally. It kind of seems like a Super Sentai thing, but I could also be skewered for not knowing it. 
So um, I, I, I defer to them to uh, talk about that, but I, I also just trust them to tell me what's, what's on the up and up from Japan that's coming over because a lot of people there um, speak Japanese in that server um, or can, at least can understand it to a certain extent. And while it's something I've always wanted to do, um, I, I've never found the time to actually sit down and take that information to heart and actually absorb it to speak or understand Japanese. So when it comes to media from over there, especially in the realm of such a niche thing as tabletop RPGs, I mean, you really got deep to find out what's happening. Yeah. Um, now, when you mentioned Ryutama, um, when I look when I look at the way things are laid out, especially especially things like text boxes, that I can definitely see. And of course, looking at the um, credits, I see that. Um, that the layout is credited by um, Emmanuel Galetto. Um, how how'd you end up meeting Emu? Um, Ema and I met through the uh, so we met through the uh, Kodama server. Still, um, so I essentially I had told everybody I was making over arms for months and months and months and was showing them my progress on it. And the people there are some of the nicest people you'll ever meet, but they will destroy whatever you're working on. Um, so, I mean, they will rip it apart. They will just go back through it, rip it apart, put it back together and say, yep, yeah, it doesn't work. So um, I had gone through, you know, so many different variations of this game and working on it and showing it off and taking some advice to heart and ignoring others. And, uh, Essentially, um, you know, one day I was just like, well, I don't know how to use InDesign, at least very well. Does anybody here know how to do layouts? And he, you know, raised his hand, and the rest is history from there. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I consider him one of, like, a, a really good friend and a great person to work with. I, I, I mean, his, his work ethic is astounding. Yeah, and... Was when when you when you approached him? What was one of the things you said to him? Um, essentially, to essentially to use um, Ryutama as a template, or was that something that just came just came up while while um, brainstorming? I think I might have lost you halfway through that question. Sorry. Um, when 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 you were when you were crafting the layout, was one of the was one of the goals you have to kind. Of, not to directly take notes from it, but to emulate some of the feel of um, Ryu Tama's layout. Um, sort of. Um, I think at the at the point when Emo was laying out over arms, um, I had completely shifted from Ryu Tama, and it kind of over arms took a life of its own. Um, I would say that you know. We definitely took a little bit from Ryutama in that sense, where we wanted everything to be laid out pretty simple. Um, and when I'm, you know, playing a game of Ryutama, I can flip through the book and find everything super easily. Now, naturally, uh, Ryutama is a much bigger book than Overarms, but um, we wanted to lay everything out to where if you're sitting at a table and you need to flip through that book, you have everything on the right hand side notated for you, letting you know where you are in the, in the book and where you're going in the book. So on the right-hand side, we kind of laid it out um, like a subway train map so that you can see that from creation, the next stop is the game um, and things like that. So a lot of the uh, design of that, too, is taken from the Persona 4 um, art books and game manual. Um, with the color scheme and everything. I think that the concept and themes represented in Overarms mostly resonate with like a part four JoJo's vibe and a part four uh, Persona vibe. Yeah, I can I can go with that. Now, when it comes to anima, I didn't I did notice the whole thing with um types. Um right. what was early early on was type something that you had that you had in mind or what or in some of the early drafts was um anima creation a bit more freeform yeah um so 
Anima creation uh, didn't have types initially. I wanted to break away from a class system entirely and essentially let people just create whatever they wanted. But then at that point, I ran into an issue because if somebody's rolling for accuracy or they're rolling for damage, they're all going to use the same stats. So people are going to have very, very similar builds. So, um, you know, the, the different typings being fighter, magician, assassin, and... Uh, um, Guardian. Guardian, thank you. Good Lord. Um, it's been a long day, okay? <laughs> um, those were created so that different builds could shine. So that essentially, you know, if you're a guardian, you can still attack with a certain way um, and hit a certain way. And uh, that's actually, that entire mechanic, the, the typings, is essentially taken from Ryutama. So shout outs to Ryutama for being the, uh, the OG there. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, to be, and to be fair, the, the approach that I see with types, um, I'm not entirely sure if I would call them classes. Um, no, they're definitely not classes. By they history. they have more they have more in common with the kind of archetype system I would I would see in say um say ex, say exalted where it's less it's less about what you can do and more about what you're what you've got more inclination towards. Um, right. Like in, like in that case, just because somebody is say in a a eclipse cast um solar exalted doesn't mean that doesn't mean that they don't know how to um they don't know how to get into melee or just be just because somebody is a knight doesn't mean that they don't know how don't know how to use a attempt to use um sorcery right right and i i wanted to i i really wanted to drive that home with over arms because um you know with a game that if it, maybe if the game was more focused on Persona or more focused on something else, um, I would have gone with a different route to determine, you know, maybe your Persona or something. But if, when you when you bring JoJo's into the mix of things, um, you, you have to take out logic and just toss it out the window. And somehow you have to take that logic that, you know, that bastardized logic that has been tossed out the window, and you have to make it function. Um, and so the only way, you know, I like I said before, I had looked at different um, JoJo's uh, RPGs that had existed out there, and none of them really nailed down the ability creation to a point to where it felt right. Um, so, again, that's probably another reason why I went ahead and made this system, because I wanted something that somebody could pick up, you know, in like an hour, cruise through the book, and... Go, yeah, I know how to play this. Like we can literally make our own abilities and use them to the extent of our creativity. And I think that turns a lot of people onto the game. But you know, naturally, if you take sides, you're going to turn some people off. Yeah. So with with that, you know, some people who aren't the super creative type struggle when it comes to playing over arms. Um, I know on Saturday, you know, there was two players I told you that didn't watch it or <laughs> didn't watch over arms, didn't watch JoJo's. And uh, they had, you know, they're, they're not super creative types. But, you know, they were able to look at the examples in the book and come up and formulate their own abilities still. So um, even if you're not a super creative person, you're able to leverage that kind of creativity to work for you, mm -hmm. which I find um, seems, to be, seems to be working pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Um, and obviously, when it, comes to my own, when it comes to my own class, sometimes I will... I will do various experiments where I give them a certain prompt and just and just tell them to go with it as far as either making a character or making a setting or an item or what have you. Sometimes right. just a random word. Sometimes I'll just I'll just pull a random word out of a hat and just say, "Okay, making it make a magic item that somehow ties back to this word," and the word right. might be door. <laughs> right, and that's great advice too. I mean, that that all works. It's, um. Well, the the idea for that came from this um this box of cards that's it, that's in my house called um table topics, that's just that's just meant to be random conversation starters when you've got company over. Um, mm -hmm. And I thought, why why don't I why don't I take that and and do and do its own thing? And then, of course, about a month ago, I did this little world building experiment using the bounce deck from Mystic Empyrean, and we ended up with the most batshit fucking. 
setting that I think I've ever come up with. Because <laughs> it, uh -huh. it was basically it was basically a mix of writing prompts and grapevine. You know, I get, I give a random word to one person, then the next person they have to keep they have to keep building off of each part. <laughs> so that resulted in some in, some interesting crazy because we ended up with places that have dragons that breathe nuclear fire. Right on. <laughs> as as you do, but yeah. Um, sounds like it'd be fun for a drinking session. Well, well, we call the monastery the open bar of the internet for a reason. Ah, uh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, it's just that we don't drink wine because we don't we don't like to pretend that we're fancy or some shit. <laughs> um, now, I do want to congratulate you on the on the fact that that um you that you have completely smashed through the original um goal that you had. In fact, it just updated. Right um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> what would you say some of the some of the takeaways that you've learned from um from the from the uh, la since the launch of the Kickstarter, even even though I know that's o that's only a, that's only a few weeks in because you're only just now at the halfway point. Yeah, we we still have 13 days left, but no one on this planet tells you how hard a fucking Kickstarter is. <laughs> um, like you'll you'll read a few things where it's like maybe you should have somebody help you with the Kickstarter, and it's like no, you need some fucking help. Get some fucking help. Like don't don't do a Kickstarter on your own. Just don't fucking do it. Like take it from me, my life has been absolutely like up and down since I started this Kickstarter because um, I mean you get messages you get messaged constantly. I mean we've we've had we've had all kinds of spam come through. We've had genuine offers for different things, like translating into other languages. Um, I mean, we've just had people asking about, um, you know, fulfillment, how it works, why they're paying some money now and paying money later, and just, you know, people confused on things. And if you're working a day job, like a nine to five, like I do, and then when you're off work, you see, you know, 20 messages in your Kickstarter inbox and 10 comments, um, asking questions, the last thing you want to do is respond to this. And on top of it, you know, um, advertising's hard, as is. Um, when you're competing with other, you know, the, the god mountain that is Wizard of the Coast and their marketing budget and things like that, um, and it, you, you're trying to hit as many people as you can within that time frame. And uh, I mean, it's it's just so much work. It is genuinely so much work that that nobody prepares you for, um, and it's it's just it's not something I would do alone again by any stretch. I'm definitely going to be reaching out and looking for help next time um, I do a Kickstarter. And the Kickstarter is not even over. I mean, I still have what almost 800 people at this current time to send codes out to so they can redeem through drive through RPG. Um, I mean, there's just, there's just so much work that goes into a Kickstarter that I can't even begin to, to tell you, like, especially for me, I, I, I never recorded videos before. So making the uh, video trailer was, was the hardest part of actually getting the Kickstarter up and running for me. Um, I did, I think, 39 takes of that trailer. And, it, it, I mean, it was just a nightmare for me. <laughs> and I, so, I get the feeling definitely. that um, if you went if you went back and looked at that trailer, you'd probably be cringing at, why why did I do this? Why did I do that? I'm sorry, you cut out there for a second. Um, you still cut out. I get the feeling that if you were to go back and look at that trailer, you'd probably end up having some moments of cringe, um... Not not that the trailer is bad or or anything like that, but more of. And hang on. Hello. Hang on, hang on. There's this. Hello. Again.
Okay, hopefully I'm back. All right, there it is. Yeah, there you go. Um, what I was saying is that I'm, I get because of the fact that an artist is their own worst critic. I'm guessing that um, if you were to look back at that at that um, fit, at that trailer, there'd probably be a few cringe moments. Oh, I, I can't stand listening to my own voice. <laughs> um, I, I can't stand it. Uh, so it's funny because I used I used to do music. Uh, I used to do vocals, but. Um, there's something about just talking, talking to somebody and trying to pitch a product that I, 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 I just, I hate, I hate doing. Um, so yeah, I, I will probably never listen to that trailer ever again. Um, <laughs> to be quite honest with you, because I'm pretty sure I can recite the entire damn thing in my head. Well, um, it's also the fact that you probably watched it about two dozen times when editing it. I'm not joking you. I started one night, and this is the first night I worked on it. I started, I think, at around 9 p.m., 9, 10 p.m., and I worked on that thing until 4 o'clock in the morning. Um, and then I went to work the next day, and then immediately after work, I started working on that, and I eventually did one final take. It worked, and I said, fuck it, we're done. That's what I'm doing. That's that's the trailer, <laughs> so it better it better work. Because one thing that is genuinely cool um, when people are, you know, encouraging you to go for Kickstarter and things like that is that they, they tell you to not worry about the you know, production quality, essentially, of the trailer. That as long as you're properly conveying what's going on, you're, you know, showing images and talking about your product, it's going to be fine. Nobody's really going to care. Nobody's judging you on your professionalism here. So... Well, let, well, let's be honest. If you were more, if you were more professional, then you'd probably then you'd probably be working at Watsi and um, thank God for thank God that didn't happen. Uh, <laughs> um, I th I think the I think the thing that in my experience definitely helps because th because this tends to lead to um a higher success rate with tabletop kickstarters is having a quick start. Yes. Yes, people. People definitely uh, within right now. The the quick start this month alone has been downloaded over three thousand times. Mm -hmm. So that that crushed when um, the Kickstarter was initially released. I think we had about a thousand the month that it was released. Yeah. Um, so it's been downloaded three thousand times. So I mean, there's definitely people out there who have benefited from seeing it and are backers now. And I mean, just like it's just like a game demo, you know. It's kind of it's kind of a double-edged sword because some people won't want to buy it because they go, "Well, this just isn't up my alley." But that's totally fine because I'm not here to fleece the money out of people's pockets. I'm here to, you know, make sure people are receiving a product that they enjoy, that they want to play, and that um, you know they feel like they're getting a good deal for. Um, when it comes. When it comes to, um, I think when it, I think when it comes to it, I I do think that having having that compared to having actual plays, actual plays are important, but um, I don't, th but they're but they're not, but um, they're gonna be well long for one, and <clears throat> they're gonna and um, you're not gonna and there's only so much that they're gonna be able to present, like they're gonna be able to present the story part of it, but people are. On some level, are going to want the are going to want the nitty gritty of it, and that's where I think the importance of a quick start comes in. Right, and I'm 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 an advocate for obviously rules light games, things that I can pick up and play the same day. Um, I, I I'm probably in the minority here, but I absolutely detest large books filled with you know if if the rules are longer than like 20, 30, 40 pages, count me out. Mm -hmm. I'm done. Um. I like something that's, you know, compact, but with a lot of options. Like, um, if Lancer rubs me the right way. Um, Lancer definitely rubs me the right way because the game's shortly, you know, it's contained pretty well. But then it has 
all of this material that you can use with it as well. And I think that that really shines when they released their quick start. Um, I, I really just fell in love with what they were doing with that game. And I also really uh, enjoy stuff like Kids on Bikes, for instance. Um, that game is so painfully simple to play. It, it's, it's, it's just one of my go-to games when I'm trying to introduce people to tabletop role-playing games. Because, I mean, everybody's been a kid on their bike, wandering through their neighborhood, you know, going into the woods, stuff like that. So everybody knows what the, the premise is. And it's just so painfully simple. It's, it's just great. And I think that, you know, that, that resonates well with a lot of people because when you see a quick start, dive into the nitty gritty. And I'm not going to listen to you play kids on bikes for three hours, personally. Um, that's just, I, I don't consume that kind of media at all. Um, I might, you know, at some point in time, but that just hasn't been, that hasn't been my go-to. Mm. <laughs> now, now, presume now. Um, in thir obviously in about thirteen days, e even though the even though that will be when the Kickstarter finishes, there's still the extra paperwork to go through after after that. Obviously. Oh God, yeah. But um, what what would you say you should first off when it comes to page count? What are you sh what are you shooting for? Like 150 pages? Oh, um, like the the uh, the book is done. Book is absolutely complete. The Kickstarter is essentially a chance for people to get the book at a slightly lower cost, and also for us to understand what the future of the book is. Um, so, I, and I, I fought with myself hard on, you know, it's like, well, do I really need to do a Kickstarter for something complete, you know? And I've for people, and the map, the vast majority of people, and um, a lot of these people being tabletop RPG designers, have told me always go to Kickstarter we'll make more money there. Um, so, you know, the game's complete. The page count, including covers, is 104. 104 pages. So, I mean, this is a book that you can really just shove in a bag and go to a convention, bust out, and play with people, you know, maybe after, like, two hours after playing it, one hour after after reading it, I mean. Yeah. And so, um, I, I, I like that page count number because it was actually supposed to be even less um, initially, but kept, you know, saying, hey, you should add this, you should add this, you should add this. I'm like, all right, well, my heart and soul is now in this book. Um, can we be done now? So um, I, I found that that's it's kind of similar to Kids on Bikes uh, link as well. And I, I really just think that around that page size is the magic number, unless you're including, you know, bonus content, like more examples, more scenarios, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, this being my first, you know, fully printed tabletop RPG, and um, you know that seemed like a good page count. But also, uh, with the source material, I feel like I've covered almost everything I could without, you know, just creating bullshit content or delaying the release over and over and over again. So overall, I think that you know the, the game's wrapped in a in a nice small package. It delivers a lot more. Yeah. Um, what What would you say you'd be shooting for as far as a release date? Are you thinking December? Definitely before December. Um, let's see. We're in September now. Mm -hmm. um, sometime, hopefully before December, before the end of September, people should get all their codes. Um, so the game will more than likely release in... Mid to late October, um, because I I'm, I need to check with Drive Through RPG, but I believe that people can't redeem the codes unless the book is live. So I could be wrong about that, but that's that's something I'm going to have to look into. So sometime between September and October, Overarms will release, and then um, limited edition will be briefly available outside of the Kickstarter. Um, for maybe 15 days to a month, and then that's never going to be seen again unless you come to a convention that I'm at. <laughs> yeah. Um, although, truth be told, if I'm in if I'm in Cincinnati, it's to it's to laugh at the Bengals. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, they're garbage. They're hot garbage. 
Um, never been a football guy, but I know that they're garbage. <laughs> I'm, a foot, I'm a football shit poster. So, yeah. And given the fact that I'm in Minnesota, I have to deal with my own form of pain and disappointment. Great. <laughs> um, but with that, with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your uh, cr- out of your crazy ass schedule to brave the hell that is time zones to come onto the show. And any um, any time that you that you see fit to ret- to return for the insanity, um, the door is always open. As we often say around here, drinking isn't mandatory, but it is encouraged. Yes, 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 yes. I've been sipping whiskey the entire time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks for having me on. It's It's been really fun. And of course, a sincere thanks to everybody who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present... My name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!